So welcome to this Game Builder call. Uh, we have this call every month. Uh, this is the August version. Uh, for anyone new here, uh, so this call is being recorded. Uh, it takes place in the Cortese Developer Community Discord. And uh, yeah, if you're watching the recording, you can join us by scanning this QR code or by checking uh, the link in the description. Quick update, we will be at ETH Global New York uh, later this, in September, I think mid-September. So if you are a hacker or if you're just around, uh, please swing by the booth uh, or maybe even build something on Cartesia if you want to. Uh, if you want to you know, play around, obviously we're in the gamer call. So if you want to build some cool games, uh, that might be a great opportunity. And obviously we'll have some prizes for you as well. Quick intro on Cartesi because I see we have a few new people as well. Um, why does this make sense for on-chain games? Basically, Cartesi allows you to spin up your own app-specific rollup on top of Ethereum or on top of other EVM layers such as Optimism. And you know, as an on-chain game developer, having an app-specific rollup means you won't face, you know, block space constraints. So you can tap into the full power of the CPU since you're basically not sharing, you know, a VM with anyone else. So this is great for on-chain games, you know, that are computationally demanding. And it also provides cost predictability to your users, right? Like if someone launches a big NFT project, um, you know, on even a layer two, right? It might get kind of congested for everyone else. So your users might not be able to, or not be willing to pay the premium to play your game. Um, on the other hand, on the right hand side here, you see this, this VM, right? This is really something interesting as well. What Cartesi provides is really this alternative VM. It's RISC-V based and, you know, RISC-V is a, is a, it's an instruction set architecture that's, you know, open source. And it's very similar to a computer chip, basically. Um, and the Cartesi machine's aim is to really emulate a full computer chip in a deterministic manner. And it can boot a Linux operating system on top of that. Uh, so the idea is that you can have all the abstractions coming with Linux. Uh, and basically you can reuse a lot of, you know, tooling, libraries, uh, content that exists on Linux today, giving you a great dev UX. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, basically. Um, yeah, and if, in the context of gaming, obviously there's a lot of content that already exists that you could tap into as well, right? Like, you know, physics engines are, are one example uh, that, you know, exists in the, in the, in the current uh, Web2 space in the software world that you could tap into, for example. Now that's it on Cartesi, uh, or at least on, on explaining Cartesi. This is the agenda for today. So we'll do quickly, briefly, some short ecosystem updates. Then we'll get, get into uh, Guilty Gyoza, our special guest speaker today. Uh, I'll introduce him in a second uh, after we do the ecosystem updates. Thanks so much for joining us, Guilty. It's a pleasure. Um, and then we'll get into some discussions. My sensation is that the, 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 the talk with Guilty might, might be a bit longer than 30 minutes. So let's see. So it might, be, uh, might kind of uh, overlap a bit with the discussions. But again, uh, I see we have a lot of people in this call. If anyone has some questions, some thoughts, you know, drop them in the comments or come on stage. Um, you know, this is, we want this to be an interactive conversation. And, uh, you know, I know there's people from various backgrounds building Web3 games, building, you know, Web2 games, building, uh, thinking about DAOs and games, thinking about AI and games. Um, I think we can touch on a lot of topics today as well. Um, so I'm very excited. So let's start briefly with some short ecosystem updates. So well, on the Ultra Chess side, there aren't any updates right now, but I know a lot of stuff is happening in the background. So blockchain is, is really working on this uh, in the background. There'll, there'll be more to share in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, for anyone new here, so this is really a cool use case where you, know, you can actually run traditional chess engines in a fully verifiable way on chain and have these chess engines basically compete against each other. Um, you know, Ultra Chess will support all UCI compliant bots, which, you know, includes most, almost all chess engines today. So users can select match parameters, make certain tweaks, and basically have bots compete against each other. On top of that, you know, you could place wagers and, you know, have other tweaks and functionalities that are really cool. Um, if you want to know more about Ultra Chess, check out the, the Twitter. Uh, obviously, this is a great, great use case for Cartesi because, um, yeah, you can actually deploy existing chess engines. 
please check out the Twitter if you want to know more. Clockchain is also in the chat if you have any questions, or he's on stage actually. Uh, but we can do that in the discussion section as well. Next up, we have Dazzle. So, uh, yeah, it's a match three strategy game. It's sort of a combination of, of um, Pokemon and Candy Crush, if you will, but fully on chain, so fully verifiable as well. We will have, uh, they will have some first play tests on Wednesday next week, on the 23rd of August. Um, time is still TBD, TBD right? But uh, please join the Discord if you haven't yet. And, and, you know, it would be a pleasure to have you guys play test this game and actually interact with the devs uh, on hand. Um, next up, Kiko, I think this will be your chance. So you have a really cool proposal as well that you posted. Uh, about uh, your Cartesian deterministic game, game engine proposal. Maybe you can touch on, uh, you know, give us a little bit of a summary of what you already did and, and what you're thinking here. Hello, Max. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing great today. So, um, first, if I can share my screen. Let me know if it works. Otherwise, I can also share the governance page if you want. You should be able to share it at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's dimmed. I think I'm not allowed to share. Um, let me try to stop sharing. I might be the bottleneck. Sorry about that. Try that again. OK, okay great. Yeah. Oh, great. I think it's loading. OK. All right, Kiko. If you want to give us a, a five minutes or so uh, rundown, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah. Really cool. so, so can you see the screen right now? Yes, sir. Yeah, we can. OK, great. So basically, uh, what I've been working on for a little while now is to create a deterministic game engine that could be running on uh, Cartesi. So basically, the problem here that uh, we have is that uh, if we have, let's say, a simulation uh, and we run it on different uh, builds with different machines and different operating systems, let's say on Windows and Linux, then we get different results. So for example, Here's a test run for a simulation. And if we can see here, he's, here's a Windows run versus Linux run. If we can uh, compare the results between both runs on both operating systems, we'll see that there is this very, very slight difference here. Uh, so let's say in the first number here, it's uh, 212. Over here, it's 230. So it's a very, very slight difference in calculations. But the problem is, as the simulation progresses, then the result starts to uh, become different, uh, given the same input, the same everything, the same code base, you get different in, uh, outputs and different results uh, on different operating systems. So this basically stems from floating point operations, because when you do a lot of floating point operations, uh, there are some very slight variations between different machines and different operating systems. And this is basically why uh, EVM, by the way, doesn't support floating point operations, because if you put floating point operations in EVM, uh, in Ethereum, and you run it on different machines and different uh, kind of clients, you'll get different results. Uh, it won't be the same exact result. So the solution for that basically is uh, one of two options, whether it's fixed point uh, op math operations or soft uh, float. Uh, fixed point is basically how, uh, if anyone wondered, so how uh, come EVM doesn't have uh, floating point, but we have tokens that have decimal places so, so this is how it's done. It's done using fixed point. Fixed point basically uses 
uh, unsigned integers and then allocate part of the uh, uh, integer itself for the uh, for the whole part and part of it for the decimal part. Uh, and this is how um, decimal places for tokens are handled in uh, in Ethereum using fixed point mathematics. This method was actually used a very long time ago in, in games, probably in the early 90s, uh, when 3D engines were still in the very early stages and there wasn't any uh, dedicated uh, graphics devices, so the processor unit was handling all the graphics. And surprisingly, it was used then as a sort of an optimization because floating point operations wasn't very fast then. Of course, right now, floating point operations is way much more faster than fixed point because now we have uh, dedicated graphics engines and, uh, and even processors. They handle uh, floating point operations much more faster. And we have also uh, soft float uh, implementation for uh, to handle uh, floating point operations. So the next step was to determine which engine should be used to uh, to work on Cartesi. So basically, we had several, uh, you know, uh, prerequisites to to have uh, to be able to run an, an engine on Cartesi. Uh, so the first two engines to basically look at the, the two most popular engines were Unreal Engine and Unity. Uh, Unity was uh, not uh, a valid option because its source code is is closed, so that wasn't uh, an option. Unreal Engine, on the other hand, was a very good uh, choice because uh, its uh, source code was fully open sourced and it was in C++. But well, after several trials and several attempts, uh, the, the source code uh, and the code base for Unreal Engine was pretty much complicated. It's uh, of course it's a very very advanced engine, but it's this advanced engine comes with a lot of complexity and uh, probably just to build the Unreal Engine you have you need a lot of resources, uh, uh, processing power, graphics, and you need over a hundred gigabytes of uh, of storage just to build uh, a single build of one real engine which is tremendously complex for any developer looking to develop and it's uh, pretty complex to uh, edit this uh, code as well in addition of course to numerous dependencies so this makes it very risky when it comes to building it on a uh, cortesi machine so uh, in, in search of another engine, uh, I started looking into other uh, alternatives to Unreal Engine. Uh, so one of the very popular engines as well that it used in a lot of AAA games and it's uh, a very well established engine is Ogre. Uh, and Ogre has the uh, bullet physics engine integrated uh, in it as well. So basically, the next step was to make Bullet a physics engine a determinist. So here's an, uh, a demo that comes with, uh, with Bullet a physics engine. This demo basically, it's uh, as you can see here on the screen, you have some falling uh, objects and then they collide with the ground and they collide with each other and they start traveling and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, this this demo, as we've seen in the, uh, in the in an early, if we go back a little bit, this is actually a run from this uh, demo. This run, as you can see, when we create the build from this demo on Windows and on Linux, as we've explained earlier, the results wouldn't match because uh, results are not deterministic across different uh, builds and different operating systems. Uh, so uh, our uh, first goal was to make uh, bullet physics engine determinist. And as you can see here, here is the uh, result after making uh, bullet deterministic. 
So the first thing was uh, attempted uh, was using fixed point operations. Uh, but after finishing with fixed point, uh, the performance wasn't very great. So uh, another alternate method was used, which is using uh, soft float uh, uh, option. And as you can see in this simulation, the performance is uh, pretty good, actually. Of course, it is still slower than uh, traditional floating point uh, uh, math, uh, but it is very uh, reasonable and could be used in actual production, as you can see in this video right here. And this is the result after implementing uh, soft float. As you can see, here is uh, a comparison uh, between Windows build and uh, Linux build. This is the beginning of the file, the right hand side over here. This is the beginning of the file and this is the end of the file. So as you can see here, the, the left portion and the right portion, they all match until the very last, from the very start until the very last uh, result. So the results here are identical and we can say that uh, the physics engine now is the deterministic uh, physics engine. And this is a comparison as well between uh, floating point and soft float. If we can see, if we magnify here at the end of the file, uh, we can see that the results are pretty close to each other. So this basically uh, it is important to determine whether soft float uh, affects the accuracy of the uh, simulation allowed or not. So as we can see here, since the results are uh, pretty close, so that means that the soft load actually doesn't uh, ruin up the uh, accuracy of the simulation itself. Because one of the things that I found out when uh, implementing first fixed point was that the accuracy was not very good. And in order to increase the accuracy, uh, uh, bigger unsigned integers had to be used that are not uh, supported on machines natively. So uh, 256 bits and 512 bits uh, register uh, integers, unsigned integers were used from the boost library. Uh, but then that was an extra performance hit as well. Maybe it increased the uh, accuracy a bit, but it was uh, even further accuracy hit. But here with soft load, luckily that we have a, a pretty much uh, good performance with pretty much accurate results. And then the next thing was to integrate that with, with Ogre physics engine, uh, with Ogre. And uh, the, as you can see the demo over here, it's, uh, it's a working demo using Bullet physics engine and Ogre. So you can see this very similar uh, simulation, uh, multiple balls falling off from uh, a high uh, end, and everything uh, regarding to physics is handled using uh, the Ogre physics engine, and the rendering itself is done using uh, Ogre. So thank you everyone, here's the references to the uh, engines, to Ogre engine and to Bullet and to the soft load uh, library. Thanks everyone and uh, please, uh, if there's uh, any questions, please go ahead, thank you. Really nice Kiko. Uh, just a reminder that this right now is a proposal under the government's program for funding. And the idea is that uh, you can use this engine to develop your game natively. Uh, with really high performance and then run exactly the same code inside the Cortez machine to check that the result is correct and this is a dispute in case someone does a false claim. So this is really cool, cool stuff. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Yes, exactly. So the, the purpose for having a deterministic game engine is to be able to get consistent results. So if let's say uh, two players are playing together uh, an online game, and then uh, after the game finishes, uh, they want to confirm if the results are correct or not. But then one of them decides to dispute the result. So they both they both submit the uh, the gameplay to Cartesi, 
and that Cortesi needs to uh, come up with uh, to run this uh, game uh, play and then determine uh, which of those two players is the honest one and uh, and which uh, one cheated basically. Very cool, Kiko. Thanks so much for presenting. Uh, I think we can move on. If anyone has questions, please, or oh, maybe someone dropped something in the chat. Oh, great work. Uh, yeah, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat or, um, you know, ask them now. Um, but we can, otherwise, we can move to Guilty Gyoza, uh, who's our guest speaker for today. Uh, Guilty, you want to check if you can share your screen? I'm not sure if you wanted to share something or not, but uh, it might be a good first start. Uh, for a short intro on Guilty, so he's the one of the founders of Topology. They've been building uh, crazy experiments, crazy on-chain games. Um, Guilty also has some great writing on his blog. I definitely recommend you check it out if you're interested in this topic. But uh, I think, Guilty, we can get started now already if you want. And uh, I don't know if you want to start presenting or we can just enter, just have a conversation if you prefer. Hi, I think um, let's just have a conversation. I wasn't prepared to present anything today. Okay, no problem. Um, do you want to give a bit of a, a background on maybe yourself and how you get kind of got into the space? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Goti Gyoza and um, Topology is the name of the company I'm running with uh, Ken Ho Kim, my co-founder. Um, we started the company by the end of 2021. Um, reason being, we discovered verifiable computing, uh, ZKP and, and Stark uh, back in summer of 2021. And we did a lot of experiments um, along the line of verifiable physics simulation, uh, verifiable um, autonomous agent behavior. Uh, those were very, very much toy experiments, but those experiments gave us a lot of confidence in this vision that we slowly grew, which is to make uh, to make realities on the blockchain and that settles on this verifiable substrate and where people can have autonomy, living, working, expressing themselves in these realities uh, instead of making realities on SaaS platforms, um, on platforms that have sort of singular admins and gatekeepers that have like godlike powers to take away things and that can upgrade things and take away things and put, put, put things back uh, uh, you know, more or less arbitrarily on their side. So that was the vision. Um, and um, fast forward almost two years later, we've done a string of experiments, uh, mostly on StartNet using the Cairo VM, which is a verifiable VM. And um, Happy to share what we did in the, in the past one and a half to two years. Yeah, no, fantastic. So you, um, maybe we can start off by talking about the kind of the journey you had from, you know, Shoshin to Isaac to Miu Miu and then, and then back to Shoshin. I know you've, those are kind of the main ones, right? Um, maybe we can kind of talk about, about that, like how, how you transitioned from one to the other and, you know, what challenges you faced along the way. Yeah, so there is, there, it, it has been very tricky and, 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 and difficult to, I think not only us, but, but most developers on the forefront, um, because it's, it's kind of like a chicken and egg problem. Um, so there's a lot of these chicken and egg problems, uh, co-star problems, so to speak. Um, for example, if you, if you don't have good, good tools, uh, you probably can't make a lot of uh, wonderfully scalable things. Um, but you, if you don't have good things to begin with, you also don't have, you also have very little idea what tools to make that are useful. Um, and the other co-star problem is um, if you don't know what the medium is good for, you don't know what application will be great to build on this medium. But on the other hand, in order to know what the, this medium is good for, you kind of have to make applications to test it out. 
Um, and so there's a lot of these co-star problems. Um, I, I, I am told by multiple people that I speak quite abstractly, which is which makes me hard to understand. I'll try to make concrete examples today. Um, uh, another interesting angle is to think about the metaverse. Right. So the, me the metaverse is this idea that we can have this virtual worlds that are inter interconnected. You can be wherever you want. There are people can make uh, build their lives, entire lives in this in these realities and virtual worlds. Um, and uh, everyone is connected to everyone else if they want across the globe and so on. Um, so there are roughly two directions to build the metaverse. Uh, one direction is let's make a sandbox kind of tool so you can do whatever you want and then you kind of hope people to adopt that tool, SDK or engine or programming language uh, or a bundle of these things to progressively make interesting virtual worlds and, and you, you pray for people to move into these virtual worlds. Um, you hope hoping, you know, daily active user numbers going up and so on. So that's sort of one direction, which is make the tool first and, 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 and go for adoption. And the second direction is to, instead of making the tool first, just make one little game, one little applications that grab people's attention. Um, and that, that application happens to be kind of a wonderful vertical slice for the uh, eventual virtual worlds to come. And so you start with a tight uh, game loop, a tight application, uh, with a feedback loop from real people that are engaging, and then you expand from there. Um, we at Topology, uh, as we started the company, um, thought about these two directions, and obviously it is really fundraisable to, to, to go th for the first route, right? Make, make the SDK say that it's the world SDK, you can make any virtual worlds you want, try to, try to do a bunch of programming language support, uh, try to do a uh, high end rendering support uh, um, and then and then maybe do a couple uh, uh, toy game demos and say this is the world SDK uh, and, and try to get adoption. Well, the other approach is let's just make small worlds that are enticing to begin with and and by doing that we study the medium, which is verifiable compute slash blockchain slash ZK validity proof and so on and so forth. And then we expand from there, hoping hoping to get wonderful early adopters and fans, even, they're, even if they're in single digit or double digit, and we expand from there. And uh, Topology was started with the second direction. And so we've been doing a bunch of experiments um, that look like toys and, and all, all, all the purpose here really is to, um, is to study what, what actually works and, what, and, and also making teams and, and so on. Um, we uh, one of the very first experiments that we did was Isaac uh, last um, summer. Um, I, Isaac was this with this with, with started with this idea that um, I, I'm sure quite some people play No Man's Sky. Uh, it's like a procedurally generated, infinitely large, uh, almost infinitely large uh, uh, universe. Um, that you can travel to, you know, different planets that have different biomes, and you can you can build different spaceships and and and, and you know play the game in in different ways ways you like. And it's it's a really infinite world. And we thought that since blockchain has this property of being unstoppable, and you know you know people can build permissionlessly on top of it, maybe it's interesting to have a uh, a world on the blockchain that are constantly challenging people to enter and to solve the problems. Uh, the world that when it when it ends, it just reboot itself from the beginning uh, with a new problem. And it also happens that we are big fans of the three body problem story. Um, and so we made this experiment called Isaac, which is a physics simulation well, well oversimplified physics simulation of the uh, three-body problem. And for those of you who may not be familiar with three-body problem, it is, imagine a solar system, but uh, instead of having a single sun, it has three suns, like three big celestial bodies, uh, three big fireballs, and, and, and they are revolving around each other. And all, all the people are living 
entire civilization is living on a small planet that is at the mercy of these three suns. Uh, it's revolving around these three big fireballs. And, and you can quite easily imagine without a physics background, right? like the trajectory of your planet will be quite chaotic, very, very, very different from our, our planet Earth. Um, and the problem is not only is the trajectory chaotic, you may crash into a sun. And obviously, Im imagining a planet crashing into a, a big fireball, that that planet is you know, destroyed instantly, um, as well as all the lives on it. Um, on the other hand, you can have the planet drifting very far away from the fireballs, and, and then the temperature drops to extreme degrees and, and makes, this un makes the planet unlivable for the lives on it. Um, so Isaac was having this physics simulation with three fireballs and a little planet. And the goal for the players is that they all live on this little planet and they, they need to work together to drive that planet. Imagine the planet being, being a vehicle or being a, being a ship. And the players need to coordinate and drive that ship together to sort of dodge the sun and put themselves back on safe, healthy trajectories and so on. Um, and, and the way they would do this is not by some kind of uh, some kind of on-chain voting that says, hey, let's in the next block, let's apply this momentum to our planet. Um, it, that could be in hindsight, that could be a more tractable experiment, but we were uh, uh, too ambitious for that. So we made a, a, another game loop inside that said uh, in order for players to coordinate and, and, and drive their planet, they need to play another game and, and they are playing this sort of mini a uh, factorial game, which is about you know harvesting resources, building pipelines that transform resources into products, sub-assemblies, and eventually things that are useful for driving the planets. And the thing that are, that were that was useful for driving the planet was uh, the planetary planetary engine. Uh, for those of you who may have read the Three Body Problem book, this was directly inspired from the book. Uh, planetary engine is a huge rocket. Imagine a huge rocket and you, you mount the rocket on the ground and the rocket kind of spits fire into the sky. And by doing that, the rocket actually pushes the planet in the opposite direction. So imagine like a hu huge rocket the size of an island pushing the planet uh, um, in the opposite direction. That is the planetary engine. And of course, this building this required a lot of resource and so the idea is all the players would sort of coordinate and play the mini factorial to try to make as many these kind of engines as possible and place them and launch them um, all through coordination so they can drive their planet uh, back to healthy trajectory. Um, as I speak about this, uh, in, in hindsight, this obviously was a too ambitious project to, 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 to be tractable. Um, then, and there were other problems. So, so we, do, we did two public play tests with Isaac and the problem became very clear that um, uh, un unstable TPS was a big issue. Uh, so TPS stands for transaction per second. Um, every player's move is made through a transaction, whether the move is as small as I just want to harvest this resource at my plant or as big as um, let's launch all our planetary engine together at once in the next block. All these moves, each, each and every one of these moves is submitted as a sub transaction. And because we were doing these on the Starkman test net and it was really early days for the ecosystem, uh, TPS was unstable, um, which kind of ruined the player experience. Um, so this, this was one reason why the play test didn't run, went super smooth. Um, other reasons just include, um, players come from different time zones and it's very difficult for them to, for them to coordinate, right? Like maybe you run a Discord channel or you, you, run a, you run a Telegram group for them to talk to each other and to time their launches, but they're in different time zones and, and they're not friends to begin with. So this game was kind of like the epitome chicken egg problem. Um, you, you need, you need uh, a lot of, the, you need good attention to a game to have uh, interesting community to play it. An interesting community will have bonds and they can coordinate well in order for a team, a team sort of teamwork game to work uh, in the beginning. Um, and we didn't solve that cold star problem. And of course, with the TPS issue, Isaac was a project that um, gave us a lot of learning, but we, we, we shelved that project.
And so moving, for, moving from that lesson, we decided that one, we need to do a small game loop. Um, all, all, and, and we were a team of two developers um, and, and, a, and a couple of part-time designers. Um, and so not to say that tiny, tiny game studio can't work, but it's more like we didn't have we didn't, we didn't even have professional experience in the game industry to begin with. Um, we came from different places before blockchain. Um, and so we decided to one, pick a small game loop and two, make something asynchronous. So asynchronous game loop is this idea that um, uh, if you and I play each other, we don't have to be online at the same time. So I think back in the days uh, when you can play Tetris battle on Facebook, a synchronous play is you don't have to play someone else uh, asynchronously, right? You can play a Tetris fight and your entire round will be recorded for as, as targets for other people to chase against. So like, and, and your play will be sort of mirrored, uh, recorded and mirrored on other players' screen on the right side and they will be playing on their screen's left side and they'll be watching you, you know, uh, uh, clearing bars and, and you want to, they want to race your records, which you played, um, you know, arbitrary number of days before. Uh, so that's a synchronous play and a synchronous play is great because we don't need each other be, to be online at the same time, but it's, it can still be a multiplayer kind of game. Uh, we're still competing, we're still interacting, there can still be uh, uh, social activities uh, uh, emerging. Um, and then we, so so starting from this idea, we made Mumu. Um, Mumu was this um, physics kind of, uh, not physics, more like um, a simulation problem. It's a simulation game. Um, the idea is that, you know, imagine al alchemy. Uh, alchemy is where you can mix things into new things, um, um, like fake science kind of, kind of way. Um, so imagine you can um, add two smiley face emoji into a, uh, a crying face emoji. Right? This is obviously not physics, this is just made up kind of physics. Uh, but by having all these different formulas um, that sort of describe how <clears throat> some emojis can transform into other emojis, you have kind of like a made up fantasy emoji physics. Um, and then starting from this physics, we, we have this game board where you kind of have to line up these formulas um, to, to form a pipeline, right? So like, for example, if we have a smiley face and a smiley face added together to get a crying face, and then maybe you add three crying faces together and you get a fire emoji. Okay, so what if I give you a, a bunch of smiley face emojis on the top left? And I'm asking you to give me as many fire as possible, um, let's say after 100 rounds. So then you will try to sort of, given this board, given this real estate, um, you would align your formulas to try to transport and, and, and synthesize these emojis as fast as possible. You know, this is a pipeline optimization problem um, and, and you want to optimize the number of fires you deliver to me at the end. Um, so Mumu was like that and p players compete by submitting their solution to the blockchain and, and uh, they will, there's ranking um, each solution is ranked by different things, um, you know, resource used, the number of fires delivered, and so on and so forth. Um, so people can compete and interact asynchronously. Um, they can they can watch other people's solution and learn from them, and so on. They can improve on top of them. Um, Mumu was a small game loop, and we had a lot of fun with it. Um, but it but it comes back to Shoshin because Shoshin was the idea we had last April. Um, Reasons because uh, our developers played a lot of fighting games and, and brawler games, Super Smash Bros, Street Fighter, and so on. Um, and we thought that that form could be applicable or transformed to be applicable to the blockchain. <clears throat> and so what if we make it a synchronous fighting game? Now, this is a really strange idea because usually when you think about fighting game, you, you think about uh, you know, two, two, two players uh, are staring at a, at, a, at a big screen and they have their controllers at hand, they're smashing the buttons and, and, and doing all the combos, crazy combos. Um, but uh, Shoshin was asynchronous, meaning that if you, if you and I want to play, um, you make a strategy and I make a strategy and our strategies fight against each other. 
And we don't have to be online at the same time. You can make your strategy and submit it yesterday. I can make it and submit next week. Um, and then matchmaking engine will pick them up and will uh, uh, arrange fights and rank them among all the other uh, uh, submitted strategies. Now, the question obviously is what is a strategy in a fighting game? Well, a strategy is essentially, imagine you're a delegate, as someone that plays on behalf of you, that knows uh, all your thoughts, all your styles and all your habits. Um, or more particularly, a strategy is basically a, um, this combination of all the things you would do in different situations. So a strategy can include if my enemy is this and this away from me, and if my enemy is happens to be jumping, I want to do this in response. And right, so this is like one statement. If my enemy does this, I do this. And you can have hundreds of them if you want. Um, you can have a lot of these different statements and they can transition to each other. So for example, um, if I do this, then I want to go to that state because I'm angry. And when I am angry and when you, when I am angry and you are backing off, I want to pursue you. I want to be aggressive. So you have all these things, uh, thoughts and habits and behaviors combined into what we call the strategy. And that's, those strategies are battle against each other. Um, people in the blockchain um, uh, may heard of a, a pretty famous experiment called a Zero X Monocle, um, a racing game between uh, uh, racing cars. Each racing car is a essentially a strategy, but in the form of a solidity contract. Um, from the get go, from the get go, uh, Shoshin was started before Xerox Monaco was public, and um, we wanted the game to be played uh, by non programmers, people that do not have any training in programming, uh, do not understand what operator is, variable is, you know, subroutines, loops, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of players play fighting game, and they have never programmed a single line of code in, in, in their lives but they can express strategies. They can express their fighting styles, what they would do in different situations. And we want to make an interface for them to express that fighting style, um, which results in strategies that are put on chain to battle other strategies. Um, I'll, I'll stop here a little bit uh, because the project is uh, quite an, an ambitious and we're at the very, very early days of it. Uh, Shoshin.gg is essentially a public alpha test with campaign mode. Um, I would say fairly shallow game loop in the sense that the move sets are small. I mean, if, if you play, uh, if you play Tekken, you would be familiar with uh, move sets on the order of 50, 60, 70 or, and, and more, um, very rich animations and, and so on, visual effects, sound effects. Uh, we have two playable characters and each character has, uh, uh, less than five or six offensive moves and, and, and one defensive move and, and, and dashing and, and, and air dashing. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so definitely in the very early days, but we can already see interesting fights uh, happening um, among the agents. And particularly the Shoshin.gg is in public alpha, which is only campaign mode. Um, if, you, if you go to that side and finish tutorial, you will you get to play campaign, which is fighting against 10 opponents that we made. Um, but at the same time, we're testing eagerly the, the, the PVP mode uh, internally uh, and then with some play testers. Because really, this game is exciting when you get to do PVP. It's kind of like when you play real-time strategy games and you finish all the AIs from easy to uh, super difficult in hell. That's when you graduate and you go to the PVP adult world and start to battle with real humans. Um, and we're kind of at that phase of making making interface and rules for PVP to work, um, and we're excited to test it out. Um, I'll stop here and happy to answer any question. Yeah, no, super cool. I love uh, also the the art and the music on the on the on the game. Um, yeah, I had a, had a great time playing it. So anyone who's uh, anyone should, everyone should check it out. Uh, definitely recommend it. You said this is this is only the start, so I'm curious what's what's like the grand vision of Shoshin? Like, where do you think this will go? Um, I don't know. And like, two, where will it be? Like, what will it look like in like three to four years? Well, I think it's really hard to tell. Um, this is not trying to be 
uh, polite or politically correct, we actually do not know. Um, we have a, such a t short time span that um, so currently our entire team is um, grinding for a tournament that we're going to host end of August in the Stanford area because there's a Stanford blockchain conference and we happen to be speaking. So uh, why not uh, why not rent a bar and just run Shoshin fights in the bar, you know, displaying fights on big TV screens that used to run soccer fights. Um, so, so we are all grinding towards that. And um, honestly, we are going to reassess after the tournament to see, uh, to, to assess the potential of this game loop in the, in the setting of PVP. Um, because you know, there's a lot to be done, even just on the campaign mode, PVE mode. Um, for example, you can be, uh, you as a player can control a playable character, but you don't have to fight uh, uh, other playable characters in a symmetric setup, right? You can have to total asymmetry where you fight, you know, uh, a bunch of minions that have uh, that have more primitive fighting styles, but they win by, by, by numbers. Or you can, have, you can fight one single boss that has 10 times your HP um, and, you know, starting with full rage at, at, at the beginning and so on, you can be put into unfair situations even just in PvP, PvE mode, which can be super fun. Um, PvP ultimately is for very different kinds of uh, uh, player group, right? Like, forget about a blockchain for a second, people that play uh, AAA games, that's for example, The Last of Us. People that play The Last of Us is very different from people that play uh, Valorant, even though, uh, even though you, you get to, ex even though it's highly packed uh, action games, um, uh, it's, it's super fast paced and so on. But one is about the story and the progression uh, through the stories, through the characters. The other really is about getting getting your skills up, uh, practicing and practicing and, and, and working with teams and, and, and going to these super high stakes fights. Um, so there are different directions we can take this and we honestly do not know. We, we will be assessing this in September. So I have to say we probably couldn't even answer for end of this year, let alone three, four years, but we'll, we'll see. And I think that's the nature of sort of experimenting at the forefront, um, making these toy-like things that people without context do not, do not understand, um, and also can't really predict far down the road. And so, you know, traditional project management uh, planning techniques don't really work well here. Um, but I think if you're hackers and if you just like, just like to uh, work on new mediums that have very little uh, uh, paradigms established, then this is a great time to do it. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. makes sense. Um, Carla, did you have a question? Yeah, I have uh, hundreds. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's start with, with a couple. So uh, when you're in PvP mode, uh, how do you determine the precedence of the actions of the players? Like if you have two players that say within 100 uh, slash, what's the player that will actually uh, hit the other one? Oh, uh, can you repeat the, the, the later part? So you said within 100 slash, uh, what was the question? Yeah, uh, I'm wondering how do you determine the precedence of the actions? Because you might have, uh, let, let's, for simplicity sake, let's say you have the same uh, strategy. So uh -huh. when you're within 100, you slash. How do you determine which player is going to hit the other one and which one is going to take the damage? Yeah, um, so right now, for simplicity, we have, we're always, um, this this is actually a, a merge effect. So, so um, I, I just came up with this um, I, idea, this analogy, um, um, you know, get merge. Sometimes it doesn't matter if you commit first or I commit first. Uh, it get merged to the same thing uh, because there's like a deterministic merging algorithm. Um, Shoshin works, Shoshin's game loop works frame by frame. So let's say if in this frame, you and I running the same strategy, do the exact same thing, we both slash. Um, the, the game loop would find that your action hitbox, hitbox is overlapping with my action hitbox because we're slashing into each other's. Um, and that will resolve into a clash condition, which if you play Shoshin, clash is, uh, you, 
when clash happens, there's a visual effect play. So, so it's like a sp yellow spark and y your sword and my sword bounce back. That's, that's a clash. Um, so that's how we uh, deal with uh, all, all these situations sort of exhaustively by merging them. And the other thing is, uh, let's say you have really good bots on both sides. Uh, do you have a sudden death uh, kind of criteria or something like that to, to end the simulation at a certain point? Uh, by sudden death, uh, can you clarify? <clears throat> well, let's say you have the two perfect bots and they would keep fighting forever because none of them has an edge. Oh, uh, right. Cannot the other or something like this. We, um, yeah, there, there can be deadlocks. Um, um, well, so we're implementing randomness right now. Um, we kind of need the randomness for the end of month P PVP event to work. Um, but without, even without randomness, we're adopting fighting game conventions. So the fight runs for 30 seconds to 60 seconds. So if you have two agents go into a deadlock, uh, time, time's up and it will be a draw or something. Yeah, cool. Mm. This is a really cool game, man. By the way, congrats. Been inspiring. So, Guilty, you talk about... Um, by the way, if anyone else has questions, again, anyone, please raise your hand or, or drop something in the chat. But, uh, so, you talk about the, the Photoshop of AI problem. I think your latest blog post was about that. Do you want to kind of, I mean, I know you touched on it a bit already with, you know, explaining a bit uh, what you meant there, but maybe you can dive a bit deeper into it. And I have a few questions around like the trade-offs, right? Because my, 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 my guess would be like, if you allow humans to like non-programmers to, to, to play these games as well, right? Wouldn't that maybe reduce the, the potential complexity of some of these bots, or is that, is that, uh, would that be a right, a correct statement? <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> the original motivation really started from the thinking that, um, well, user generated content is all the rage, but when you, t when you search for, Examples of UTC platforms is, is usually static. It's either static or, or it's full on programming mods. Um, and by static, I mean, you know, create your own skin, create your own uh, emojis, um, create your own uh, models, create your own maps. Like map editor is a, is, is a wonderful example. And um, we're thinking, if, if there is all it is, I don't see blockchain playing a, a, a central role in facilitating um, better and better UGC. Well, you can obviously go for financialization route and say, oh, uh, blockchain allows free trading among these uh, these uh, UGCs by different creators and more creativity, creativity can spawn from a free economy. Uh, I think that's definitely one angle. Um, I, I guess the topology team is interested in other angles that may synergize with that. Um, and so we started to think about, well, if not static, uh, user generated content, but not full on programmable mods, right? Because if, you, if UGC is, if you think about, if you equate complexity with necessity to program, then, well, you can say maybe our kids or, or, or maybe at the, from, at the generation of our grandchildren, um, you know, I don't know, 75% of the earth population can code in some kind of programming language that happens to be maybe verse, right, by Epic Games. Maybe 75% of earth population in 2050 program in verse and they all work in the metaverse and create stuff in the metaverse. I think that's, I think that's definitely that organization is pushing for better programming literacy for the sake of expanding the metaverse. Um, there must be a middle ground. Um, another another uh, middle ground would be uh, um, AI facilitated uh, UI. Uh, so for example, GPT powered kind of user interface where you can prompt the AI into making complex stuff that you would never have been able to make, make it, uh, handcraft or program it. Uh, but AI kind of understands your intent and transforms your intents into wonderful complexities. That, um, that also is not what we, we really interest, 
are really interested in um, for the reason that um, AI can be magical, but it, it can also be frustrating because you don't have good control over its output. Um, and also because we 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 fell down a rabbit hole of um, um, game AI. So we have to clarify game AI is not AI. Uh, well, AI is very, very much a blows the term. Uh, um, uh, when we say game AI, we mean uh, NPC behaviors, just uh, stuff of life forms or uh, characters in the game that's not controlled by a real human uh, in real time in, in another screen. Um, th those are NPCs and NPCs run game AI so they can behave in the game world and, and they appear to be lifelike. Although obviously they're, they're quite stupid. You can figure out they're looping through some, some options. Um, we fell down a rabbit hole of wanting to uh, focus on game AI uh, as the sort of the the, the, the kind of UGC that in really interests us, um, and so our our pro our problem statement becomes: How do we um, drastically lower the, the 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 entry barrier for non programmers to make game AI themselves? Uh, game AIs can be you know uh, your virtual pets that follow follow you around in MMORPG world. Game AIs can be this this dragon boss that that players will have to team up and and. and uh, a team of six to fight, um, and so on. All these are NPCs. Um, and Shoshin is one tiny step towards that. Um, I think the, the point really is lowering the entry barrier, um, even if we have to lower the complexity of the agent. But our, our thesis really is the opposite. We think that if you lower the entry barrier for more people to come in, um, the resulting the resulting behavior can be very complex, um, assuming we can compose. So composability comes into the, the, the equation here. Um, let's say uh, if you if you play Shoshin, I play Shoshin, and we're a team. Um, you are responsible for making strategies that can dodge really well, and I'm responsible for making strategies that can. Uh, uh, Exp take advantage of uh, my enemy's vulnerabilities and attack really well. Obviously, your strategy is complementary to mine, right? You, you focus on dodging, I focus on attacking. So what if our strategy can combine? So that, that allows people to work together on game AIs. So even if you have one non-programmer making an AI that's super dumb, um, if you have 1,000 non-programmers making game AIs that are complementary to each other. The combination of those, these AIs and behaviors can be quite interesting and rich and nuanced. So um, composability comes in to the equation uh, and blockchain facilitates composability. So that's kind of the, the, the that's kind of the, the big picture thing. Great. Okay. That makes sense. Interesting. David, I think you have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. First of all, Excellent job, great execution on Shoshin. I think uh, the level of polish and the Fatui, etc., is really, really good, particularly for an on chain game. <clears throat> My question it feels like um, different people make their games on chain for different reasons. And one of the things, one of those is financialization or hyper financialization. That's not why we're building on chain games, and it doesn't sound like that's why you've built Shoshin on chain. But do you think that its uh, financialization is inevitable? Like, uh, which seems to be some people's opinion. Well, I think that I think that when you have when a lot of people have reasons, very much different reasons, but strong reasons to live in a world together, and they 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 have to collaborate to make lives more interesting and more livable. Um, economy happens and, and, and things get traded. Um, so I, I see that as inevitable, but inevitable as a word uh, sounds negative. Um, I, I, I think that because blockchain started with Bitcoin, which started trying to solve, uh, you know, a uh, double spending problem in a decentralized way, and it has impl direct implication in fi finance. And so you almost kind of have this sort of uh, the nightmare of, I, I, I think in this way, I think blockchain in, in, in the first 10 years is like the nightmare of um, 
Karl Marx, which is you have these things that can trade upon that kind of is money, but is kind of money running at light speed, but don't carry any other real value on top of it, only beliefs.、Um, and it, it's really weird, but we we have this engine that can run money systems、uh, quite well.、Um, I think the focus here is on making worlds that are livable, that people have strong reasons to live in,、um, uh, reasons sort of external to money making.、Um, when I think when that happens,、um, the the fact that blockchains can run money systems very smoothly is going to amplify the livability of these worlds.、Um, but I kind of think that、uh, conflating these together is.、Uh, Um, I won't say it's a mistake, but it's just a position we're not interested in.、Um, I suppose no in the future, but it's really much a aesthetic decision here. Yeah, I I wonder if it becomes a problem to balance the game with people looking to extract the value from it, and others that are there for different motivations. Well,、um, Bardo's player archetypes, right?、Uh, among、um, Among one hundred gamers in the world, if you average them out, less than one gamer is a killer type. You have you have ten explorers that kind of just want to flip every stone and 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 run every boss and and you know get all the medals and achievements. And then you have ten achievers that kind of want to get the the high rankings、uh, and 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 you know enjoy the glory of it. And then you have eighty other people among the one hundred that kind of just want to make friends and and not feel lonely. Um, and so the killing part here really is because I think、uh, blockchain focusing on fast money systems, easy money creation, attract a lot of the killer types.、Um, I think that's that's sort of the that's the reality that can't be sad.、Um, but I think as as project builders in this in this space, we we can decide on what kind of people we want to attract. Thank you. Yeah, great.、Um, if anyone else has questions, Clockchain, I know you also have some thoughts around this topic. Feel free to unmute yourself.、Um, otherwise, I'm curious about、um, maybe to zoom out a bit more.、Uh, I know you've proposed or you've worked on the Karstow concept, and、uh, basically, just curious about this topic of governing these worlds, right? I think you've put a lot of thought in, into this as well. It's kind of related as well to the to this financialization topic. I think, right?、Um, you don't necessarily want people to buy、uh, since the same votes and to govern these worlds if they're just there to like just buy tokens and and then have a say. You want them to be actual players, right? Do you want to expand on that, Guilty, a bit? Sure.、Um, Isaac was、um, kind of more, more ambitious than than than, than I describe it,、um, which also contributed to its downfall because we we couldn't attractively match the the project.、Uh, but Carstyle is one one feature of the Isaac project, which is on the governance side.、Um, we love infinite games.、Uh, James Cars、uh, wrote a book on infinite games. It's a game that you play not to win, but in order to to play to play more. And to play better and to enjoy more, so like infinite game is the opposite of let's say、uh, college entrance exam, right? You you play the game of、uh, practicing and do well in the entrance exam only so that you don't have to do it anymore in the rest of your life. That's a finite game.、Um, infinite game is kind of like if you enjoy Valorant, for example.、Um, I don't play Valorant. I just I I, I love、um, how、uh, Riot Games focus on、uh, their art. So. By Valorant jumps jump, jumps into my consciousness recently,、um, but、uh, if you play Valorant a lot, you're probably not to not trying to play Valorant so that you get some status and you stop playing altogether. You kind of want to get better and better, and you follow on, along the stories. You play all the new characters and so on.、Um, so that's infinite play,、um, and and we we thought that in order for quality governance to happen, you kind of need uh,、um, people with uh, the kind of The 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 mindset that want to govern the projects long term to have the power to govern the project. You 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 want the power to be in the right hands, 
And um, how do you how do you create a rule set to incentivize that behavior or the participation from those people and sort of disincentivize the people that that participate in the finite play, a finite game kind of mindset? Um, and so Karstadt was this uh, example that uh, it was discovered in kind of experiment that you would play Isaac and the amount of votes that you would get depends on how well you play in the game and how well you coordinate with other players in the in, in, a, in a previous game. And so the only way as a player to to get governance power in this style is to play a lot and to play really well. Um, and uh, once you have the vote um, in your wallet, um, you you can vote on things. And, and for example, you can vote on proposals to upgrade the contract, to change rule sets of the game and so on. And obviously there's a lot of failure modes this, this thing can go wrong, right? Like what if people collude and start playing games that are you know, inf um, inflating each other's score and getting a lot of votes and just trying to kill the project? Um, so I think I think Carsdale as a DAO experiment is very much very primitive, but I think it's it's along the, the correct direction. It, it is just too primitive to begin with. And also we uh, paused that line of thinking for now because if you don't have something really valuable to govern over, I think it's really difficult to attract serious people to, to want to govern it. Uh, it. It remains an experiment. It, re, it remains sort of attracting uh, uh, people that may want to um, may, maybe predators if there's money to be made if this is on the mainnet with re real tokens right or if you maybe you attract philo philosophers or you know, governance theorists kind of people and I, I think that takes that only takes projects uh, forward um, in in very limited degree um, and so eventually we we focus on the core game loop we focus on the kind of the core um, application paradigm that could work. And we believe that once you have that small game that are enticing to people, uh, uh, that are really inclusive to, you know, a, a broad uh, uh, sort of a spectrum of people, not just theorists, but also uh, non-programmers that are artists, that are, um, you know, engineers in other, other uh, industries that never program um, that, um, all kinds of people, then you have a real governance question to deal with. And I think, I think then uh, making governance systems uh, will, be, will be fruitful. Um, yeah, so that's sort of our trajectory. And Carsdale is on the uh, Isaac documentation for anyone interested in, to look into. Great, yeah, no, it's super interesting. I mean, I guess there's also the component of like agency and, you know, giving players already from the get-go sort of power over the game but it makes sense that yeah probably you don't want to have a DAO that governs over some, something rather small at the beginning um i'm curious also about so last last call with, with david we spoke about um you know um not meta rules but i think you in your context you call them meta rules uh kind of this digital physics right uh, David, I think you recall that 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 conversation. Uh, guilty is that sort of? Uh, would you would you say that the meta rules are sort of similar to that? Yeah, I I, I think that um, I I kind of agree with um, the lattice team in saying that autonomous worlds slash onchain worlds they are kind of socialist on the very bottom um, because you can have digital physics that are wonderfully designed uh, that can spawn wonderful em emergent gameplay and so on and so forth uh, but if people vote to change it they, they it can be changed uh, and I, I think that's, that's wonderful but we just have to face the reality that, that there's there's a social consensus um, beneath the, 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 the quote, quote unquote immutable physics um, and coming back to meta rules, I think meta rules is also subject to community toppling it and changing it. So it's immutable, but um, um, it, it can't be changed by uh, the, the, the community. 
Um, but meta rule is kind of the rule, the rules that are meta to the digital physics. So one example is imagine um, a imagine if imagine a, a flower brewing game. So the goal is to you know brew flowers. So if you mix different flower with different uh, DNA strands, you get different uh, you know flower species that have different shapes and colors and patterns, and and you would get sense of achievement by getting super rare colors and mixtures and. And, and interesting geometries, uh, maybe flowers that eat insects and so on. And obviously, there will be some kind of rules that govern, you know, how DNA strands uh, merge together, how mutations work, um, what's what's the implicate, what is the mapping from a DNA all the way to you know color and representation and so on. But then the meta rules here is trying to solve perhaps the problem of uh, game balance or meta by saying that, okay, so what if there's an NFT marketplace happening on top of this flower brewing? Uh, this is kind of like a um, uh, crypto flower. This, this is like crypto kitty, but, but for flowers, right? And so imagine there's like an NFT marketplace on top and people agree that this and this and that breed is the rarest and they can trade for the highest price. And all the players' attention are, are basically flooded towards trying to brew those flowers. Um, maybe, we can have meta rules underneath the, the DNA mutation rules, such and such. And the meta rules would kind of topple the rules based on the activity. So let's say some species are so concentrated, all the players are brewing those flowers. Maybe the meta rules will flip the mutation rule so, so as to flav, uh, flavor other strands or create new strands or destroy all strands. Um, or make the meta strands super easy to synthesize. And if you make it super easy to synthesize, you have the, you lose the scarcity and maybe that destroys the price of the NFT marketplace and so on. So met, I think meta rules basically is algorithmic game balance. Um, but, but I think algorithmic game balance can be really difficult to get right. Um, I think you kind of need to have uh, uh, benevolent people in power to guide the direction of balancing um, and I think meta rules may be some tool sets for game balancing to happen but I, I don't think it's all there is to game balancing but one, one fun, interesting about blockchain obviously is you can create programs that run autonomously and so if you have if you have meta rules created in the form of small contracts and, or programs running on on blockchain VM um, these these rules are enforced uh, automatically and uh, that may bring upon worlds that just generate more drama and over the long term because if a meta form the meta rules kick into action and, and sort of destroys that meta and you uh, you know that the balance is destroyed and player player behavior uh gets chaotic again trying to find a new meta and then once the new meta is formed the meta rules discover and kick in and destroy that meta again so you have these um, um you will have these sort of oscillation and that may be interesting. Um, yeah, so meta rule basically is algorithmic um, um, autonomous sort of uh, game balancing process. Um, whether it's useful or not, we'll we have to see. Uh, I think Shoshin does have that idea on the roadmap, but um, it's very much uh, uh, far down the road. Um, we need to get the uh, core game loop right. We need to get the PVP setup right. So we'll, we'll, we'll see when we get to experiment that. But uh, we'll love to obviously see um, attempts experimenting with algorithmic game balance um, on, on the blockchain. I think um, Paradigm recently published an article uh, titled uh, The Open Problems of On-Chain Games, and it mentioned meta towards the end of the article. Um, so that's also an interesting uh, angle and entry into this question, I think, for people that are interested in this. That's super interesting. I think another direction might be that uh, we come up with games that uh, have just uh, a gazillion different uh, instances in parallel. So basically the community will shift between different forks depending on how someone has uh, curated uh, the balance of the game. I kind know, of like in this version, people did something, they attacked, colluded, and they destroyed the reality, but someone has done a fork before that's still stable, it's still funny, and it's still balanced. 
Yeah, I, I think I think that will work really well. Right. So you can you can imagine um, you can imagine having like a trading card game, and and maybe the official created uh, let's say five hundred different cards, and of course the official will have like an official game rule. How these, how a game is structured, how many cards you can bring into a game, when you can draw a random card, and so on. But then you can have alternative game rules that also work with this exact same 500 cards, but have alternative game rules. And I think the nature of blockchain is, uh, it's it's quite hard to build a moat uh, around code because code is kind of expected to be open source. Um, so may the best game balance win. May the guess may the best rule set win. Um, so that that can definitely work. Um, but I think I think a lot of this comes down to um, projects willing to ex really experiment in this form and not compromise. Uh, I, I think I think it's a good thing that recently fully on chain game becomes a a topic and a, and a narrative. Um, I, I hope to see more developers come into the space and explore new things. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, what would be some other tips that you would give to to on chain game developers? I mean, I think I like your your philosophy of like starting small, just have like one game loop, really tailoring that. Are there any like other sort of like uh, you know mental models or like uh, you know tips that you would basically give them? Um, I think that. Uh... I think knowing your reason why you want to make entrepreneurial on-chain game is important. Um, I think, I think, for some people, it's really important for them to make games that they themselves like to play. Um, for other kind, for other people looking at things in a more you know business optimization kind of angle, they want to make a lot of experiments, kind of like a portfolio of games, and hoping for, hoping one game will stick. Um, regardless, they like to play it or not, they just they they just go all data driven. Uh, uh, player feedback and so on. Um, so it depends on if you're a craftsman or if, you, if you're a businessman. Um, and also for on the engineering side, maybe you think, well, I'm an engineer, so I, I, I write code, I implement things. Um, but I think working with the wrong type of, uh, um, working with people that are inc incompatible with your aesthetics can be re really draining. So you may, you you so as an engineer you may want to make games that just a lot of people are playing and regardless what the game the game mechanics are you kind of just want to have a game that works that have massive adoption uh if you're that kind of engineer then um you would you will pick certain partners to work with uh certain designers certain uh you know community managers and so on um, and on the other side if you are engineers that have that also happens to have aesthetics into game mechanics has you have opinions into what quality game mechanics are, um, um, then uh, you will be creating very different kinds of games. And I think that's one th one thing important to figure out. Um, I think a lot of these, um, I would never, I would never, never say that I am an experienced game dev. Um, we come into this space precisely because we are very inexperienced with game development. But we're also quite frustrated with the sort of the the game industry focusing excessively on marginal improvements and and, and resolutions, um, and way less on core game design. Um, and th that's that's all well and good for adoption for you know um, game companies to make money and 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 more people to play games, which is also great. Um, but um, we come to this new medium because we want to experiment with new me mechanics, fundamentally new mechanics. Um, and what's a better place to invent new mechanics than to come to a new medium? Because there's no paradigms formed yet, so feel free to experiment anything. Um, so I think if you're one of these people that just want to explore new things and are tired of, um, you know, all these paradigms, how games are being categorized. If you go into game industry, you have to get one, two, three credits and degrees to, to work in this one, two, three roles to climb the ladder. Um, this forefront is a, a wonderful place for you. You get to invent new things and there, there's no rules yet um, other than uh, some some early uh, developers trying to uh, you know, write articles and books that predict the future. Um, so I think that's one thing. The other thing is definitely, um, then this is, this is a personal opinion, but definitely um, 
don't imagine games to be this one million code big project that you have to run, you know, full on game engine to handle complex rendering and and a bunch of like memory management, packaging, all this complex stuff that game engines do under the hood. Um, since you're just writing programs in a blockchain VM, um, you get to write every single line of code. If it's a 5,000 line of code, you get to write every single one of them. There's no game engine running in the background. You just, you, you, you yourself manually craft every single line and, and you get to understand every single line. Um, so I, I would say definitely don't be bothered by uh, lacking better tools. Um, there's a reason why we don't have very good tools yet because th there's no clear path. What are the wonderful applications to make? And so it's really difficult for tool, ma tool makers. Um, so topology is of the position that we got to make wonderful applications first. Um, and, I, and I think this is a wonderful time for people that know how to program. Um, if you can, for uh, if you can sort of suspend the belief that you need a game engine to make a game, if you suspend that belief and just go into the VM and write code and make games, and I think you will go a long, a long, long way. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Do you have any questions? Does anyone else have any questions? Um, we have a few minutes left, but yeah, just wondering if, if, you know, I have, I have a couple of answers. Sorry. What's that? So like, what do you see the main sort of value prop of on-chain gaming outside of like financialization right because composability and fun all of those things are stuff that exists like in web 2 games so like what is the value prop of on sort of on-chain gaming i think it's um there i think there are multiple layers to that one layer is definitely it's a new space so you get to invent new things um, that um, the the prop the, the the metaverse creators proper metaverse creators will ignore you for for a very long time and that's also great because you get to focus on making new things. So for example, if you forget about blockchain and if you want to make you know you, you know UGCs, let's say metaverse is virtual worlds with all these UGCs uh, user generated content, uh, you know custom maps, custom buildings. Uh, character skins, game modes, and so on and so forth. Um, if you search the web, you kind of have to go to one of these platforms, right? Uh, in, go to Roblox and make on top of Roblox or invent a new Roblox. Uh, maybe go to go to Minecraft and, and try to make a, a, a better Minecraft. Uh, or you go to Fortnite and try to try to learn verse and make and um, build their metaverse, um, believing that they will revenue share with you. So it's partly yours meta metaverse to build. Um, or maybe you believe in Zuckerberg's vision of metaverse and you kind of go there and learn a, a software stack and, and make stuff. Uh, but I think one, one thing about blockchain is because it's such a vacuum, um, well, of course, there's dozens of on-chain game experiments running, but I would say, relatively speaking, it's a vacuum. Um, you get to really invent radically new things. Uh, you have the freedom to do new things. Uh, so I think that's really one um, ironic um, uh, uh, sort of advantage of the space is, is really new. So you can invent new things. Um, and I think on top of that, the, the blockchain crowd is susceptible to new things. So you have a crowd that won't complain to you because the game doesn't have smooth, you know, authentication, login, one click login. It doesn't have connection to Steam or, you know, it can't play cross platform. Players in this space won't complain about that. They would have more patience, play your game, and they will give you more quality feedback. Um, so that's another angle. Um, other angles include uh, there's there are other uh, t technologies that make that may uh, uh, break the paradigm. So for example, validity proof, the, the fact that you can ZK proof computation and verify that that computation cheaply on the other side uh, is one affordance and it may spring into wonderful game mechanics. And this thing is so early, um, it's very difficult for big game or metaverse corporations to consider it. Um, um, I'm not speaking, I'm not saying that they don't have smart people, they have a ton of smart people, ambitious people in, the, in, in their big uh, uh, organizations. But it's just like the nature of those organizations sort of prevent them from sort of inventing new things in a grassroots way. Um, and in this space, things get invented in a very, very much grassroots way. So that's great. 
Um, other things include blockchain has composability as a property. And so far, we only see composability working in the DeFi space. Uh, composability doesn't really work in the game space yet for many reasons. Um, but someone may eventually crack that or some combinations of projects may eventually crack that uh, uh, problem. And I think it's a wonderful future to look forward to uh, composability in, in virtual worlds. Um, like Zelda, right? Like the Zelda came to uh, uh, a tier of the kingdoms. Uh, you have wonderful composability. You can make aircrafts that fly, that tumbles on the ground with legs and wheels. And you have all these different materials and shapes that can compose into each other. But that's limited to the Zelda metaverse. Or maybe it's not as grand as a metaverse, but the Zelda tier of the kingdom, uh, 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 a virtual world. What if you can have permissionless, permissionless uh, uh, composability? That would be a very interesting topic. But I don't, I don't think these uh, IP owners would be very interested in exploring the permissionless side of things just because of the business models they run. So, What are some of the main incentives to build on top of um, maybe an on-chain game versus, you know, Roblox? Well, I think it depends on what you, what you uh, look for in return, right? Like for on, on, on Roblox, you have clear uh, roadmaps to monetization the equations are set for you. You can sort of plan things to, to, to make content, to make money or get action. Um, fully launching game is a new medium. I, I don't think there's any set path for you to do that yet. Um, but I think on the other hand, fully launching game doesn't suppose rendering, uh, rendering stack. So I, I think when we, when we say fully launching game, um, we don't really mean it fully. I, I think I think we I think this space has a consensus that if you have core game state and logic on chain, it's fully on chain. But you don't have you don't need to have the assets, you know, the sound effects files, the 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 the, the, the images, the videos to be also on chain. Um, and so that means you have full rendering uh, freedom. You can render things in, in different perspectives, different resolutions, just different artistic styles. You're not limited to these platforms and the kind of the rendering uh, engines they run and the limitations they bring. Um, so more freedom, uh, but the cost is not being guided. So much, much more uncertainty and you, you kind of have to invent things. Love that. Yeah, I'd love to see a, an open on-chain Zelda game. David, I see you put something as well in the chat. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Guys, I think we're out of time, but this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, Guilty, thanks so much for joining us and spreading your wisdom. It's been super, super interesting. And uh, yeah, hope to see you guys in the next one. And David, I see you have a lot to talk to say about this topic as well. Hope we can do that in the in the next call. And uh, again, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.